Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. That was a nice one. I like that. Cheerful. You guys doing all right? Yeah, you're looking good. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I like to take walks. I like to go out for a walk. Sometimes I work from home, so to prevent myself from going crazy, well, I was not successful in that, I go out for a walk. And I usually like it, but not on refuse day. When the garbage cans are out, they're all overflowing, and then there's gnats. Why, God, gnats? Why? They get all in your face, make you look crazy. Anyway, I've been noticing a lot of boxes when I walk through the neighborhood. Empty boxes just out on the sidewalk. Especially flat screen TV boxes. Tons of them all over the place. Some of them are huge. I live in like a middle income neighborhood, so the houses aren't gigantic or anything. But you have these ridiculously big TVs for these really small houses. Where did it get put in that house. Maybe the garage? <laughs> I can see their TV. From my house, huge TVs. I started thinking, why did everyone decide to buy TVs at the same time? And I remembered stimulus checks. Stimulus checks. I remembered that. Come on, guys, you should have got that. But I understand. So. Some of you make more money, and so you didn't get the stimulus check. Some of you needed the money, so you didn't buy a TV. But in my neighborhood, we're like middle-income people, so we really didn't need it, and so we just spent it on big TVs. I didn't get a big TV yet. Some of it's in the bank. So as I'm walking along, something occurred to me. I forgot to tithe from that check. Ooh free money, and I didn't even give any to the church. So when I got back home, I said, Heather, we got to give some of that to the church. It's important. Okay. And then it occurred to me, we must have had a really good month at the church, right? Because again, some of you, you didn't get it. Some might have needed it, and that's okay. So I checked. I don't have anything to do with money here. I just beg for it. That's all I do. I say, I need money. I want to do this crazy thing. I want to buy, like, the neighborhood. No, you can't do that, Gene. So they don't let me play with any of the money. So i got to ask. So I say, how are we doing? We must have had an amazing month. No. At first, I was pretty disappointed. This is free money, guys. Come on. You know what we're trying to do here. And I thought, oh, maybe they just forgot. I thought a little bit more about it. I got another idea. It occurred to me that a lot of Christians are conservatives. They're fiscally conservative. So as far as I can remember hearing, I don't watch the news a whole lot. We'll get to that in a minute. But there were no conservative members of Congress who voted for this. Ah, and conservatives have the courage of their convictions. They put their money where their mouth is, so I know what must have happened. They sent the check back. <laughs> that must be it. It must. It's got to be it. Speaking of politics, I'm going to test you guys. Let's watch this video.
Okay. Now, if you laughed, I'm going to let you off the hook just this once. Phil, he laughs at everything. We watch movies, somebody died, he laughed. He thought that was funny. So you, you get a pass, Phil, I can hear you over there. He laughs at my jokes even when they're not funny. That's okay. But if you laughed, I'm going to give you a pass. Because I did too the first time I saw it yesterday. Until the Holy Spirit said, what's wrong with you? That's what happened to me. That's not funny. Imagine if we were outside in the parking lot. And we watched as an 80-year-old man tripped up the stairs, not once, not twice, but three times, and no one ran up and helped him. Shame on you. He's a human being. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me. You know what else he said? Throw your message away for Sunday. I'm done with you and your opinions. Watching this stuff has eroded your humanity. That's what he told me to say. Say that. Not all your fancy stuff about what you know about the Bible. If you're not getting it that right, that right you're getting nothing right. Doesn't matter what you know. That's what the Holy Spirit said to me. I'm tired of you today. I believe that our politics is infecting our Christianity. And if it's happening a little bit to me, what's happening to my flock? So today, I hope this brings you healing. We need to heal from this, amen? amen. We really do. In the kingdom of heaven, there's no Republican or Democrat. It doesn't matter. We need to heal from this stuff. It's gone too far. So I threw away my message. And today, we're going to take a break from the program. We're going to take a break from that. And we're going to get into this. This is all we need to know. It's all right here. It's not on the news. And I only watch it a half hour a day just to see what's going on in the world, just to kind of keep up with things so I know what you guys are talking about. And if it's getting to me at a half hour a day and I'm in the Word the rest of the time, what's happening to you? What must be happening to you? You ever hear the phrase, you are what you eat? We learned that as kids. This is what happens to our minds, what we digest with our eyes and our ears. It pollutes us, or it enriches and enlightens us, correct? I'm just, I've said this before, I'm getting done with opinions. I just really am. I've been dissatisfied with everything from the news, typical preaching. Why? Because let me tell you a little bit of, you know, maybe God's word and then everything I think, all my opinions about it. I don't care. It's all right here. It's all right here. It's so funny. And I've caught myself doing this, even on social media. I've stopped posting Tozer and all this other stuff. We're so arrogant. We're so arrogant. We have God's word right here. And you know what we do? We say, ooh, let me come up with a really cool line that's going to get everyone's attention that's better than what God said. What? So all I post now is scriptures. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about opinions. And we see it in the news all the time. We think these guys are so smart. Oh, he's so good. He's a doctor of this and that and the other thing. He's so smart. And what happens? Names the ministry after himself. Makes all kinds of money. And we find out he's cheating on his wife with all these different women. Does any of his opinions matter anymore? So I'm not going to give you too many opinions today. I told you what God slapped me in the back of the head with yesterday. And so I'm going to do my very best to be obedient this morning. That's all I can do. We're going to turn off the world today. 
and open up the Word. We have to look at the world with the right lens. This is critical. It's really important. So I want you to think of it this way. Sometimes, a lot of the time, Christians look at the Word of God through a worldly lens. Their ideas, the lens of the world, and they see this thing, when it's got to be the exact opposite. You have to look at the world through this lens, the other way around. That's how you get it right. That's how you do Christianity the right way. I told you in the past, it's the same thing with the New and the Old Testament. we got to look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New. We see this all the time. Hebrews, we did that in the Hebrews series we were in. It's perfect. So much. You have to know the Old Testament. So we went back there so much to understand it, what it's all about. Very, very important, critical. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at a few books of the Bible, and I'm going to give you the context. We're not just going to grab a verse and then whatever I want it to mean. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you the reason for writing these books. There's a reason that Paul writes some of these things to the church. Well, you have to bear with me today because, you know those big TVs? There was a point at which I needed glasses. Instead of getting those glasses, I just got bigger and bigger and bigger TVs. <laughs> and so the words in my Bible are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and so it takes a little longer now to flip through all the pages. <laughs> bear with me. Again, I just got hit in the back of the head with this last night, so we're just going to roll with it like Bible study. So, Romans. A lot of Christians are like, Romans is the greatest theological work ever written. Maybe. But Paul didn't sit down like we do today and say, ooh, I'm going to write the greatest sermon anyone's ever heard. No. This is what God's telling me. Your church needs to hear something today or tomorrow. That's what the Holy Spirit did with Paul. The church in Rome has got some problems. I've told you this in the past. Initially, Christianity is a Jewish religion. It's a Jewish sect. It's all Jewish people. So we learn this. Acts 18, Paul runs into Priscilla and Aquila. They're coming into the Corinthian area. There was a time when the emperor Claudius, around 49 AD, he expelled the Jews from Rome. They didn't like Jewish people there. Why? Well, one reason is, you're going to take a day off from work? No. We need you to work at the pub on Saturday or whatever it is, right? So they don't like them. There's a whole bunch of other reasons. They expel them. But then they come back. In the meantime, the church is forming. But now by Gentile believers, that is non-Jewish people. And so when the Jewish people come back, they're looking at a church that doesn't look like this sect of Judaism, this Christianity, the sect of the Nazarenes. It wasn't yet called Christianity right away. Not until the Romans started making fun of Christians, little baby Christs, these fools who follow this God who died on a cross. They were mocking them. Anyway, the Jewish believers get there and they start arguing. No, you have to get circumcised. You have to take a Sabbath. You can't eat the meat, sacrifice the idols. You have to drain the blood out of the meat. It's complicated. The Gentiles are like, whatever. And so they're bickering. They're fighting about it. Oh, do we do that today? Are any of us more holy and righteous than somebody else in the church? Mm. So it's going on right from the beginning. So Paul has to step in, cut it out. That's what Romans is all about. I didn't even mean to rhyme that. Anyway, so Paul starts out the gate. Everybody sinned. It's obvious that God exists. No one has an excuse. Chapter 2, you Jews, ah, don't get ahead of yourself. You know so much, teach yourself. You're sinners too. Chapter 3, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul levels the playing field. He gets into the law. By the way, did you know Abraham, he had faith before he did any of that stuff like circumcision. Didn't have the law of Moses yet. He had faith before then. 
It's by faith. God's grace and your faith in Jesus Christ alone that you are saved. Cut it out. Chapters 5 through 7. Christ and Adam contrasted. And no, in chapter 7, Paul is not struggling with sin. It would void what he says in chapter 8. It's called prosopopisi. I probably pronounced that wrong too. To make a face. He's making fun. He's pretending, taking on the persona of Adam there. And then he moves to chapter 8. A new life in the Holy Spirit. This is how we do it now. Not by the law. 9 through 11. Natural questions come up. What about the Jewish people who didn't accept Jesus? So Paul, he's agonizing for them. He cares, but he has hope. And he gives a beautiful illustration of the wild olive tree being grafted in. Hey, Gentiles, don't get too ahead of yourselves mocking these Jewish people. Right? If they're a branch that's fallen off, they can easily be grafted back in. More easily than you, maybe, Gentiles. And now, the letter turns. Because of all this stuff, we got all the theology. And this is what it says. Therefore, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Did you get that? What? What is? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, living sacrificially towards other people. Oh, I thought I could do anything I want and come here and sing a bunch of lies. No! I'll read it again. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, or CNN, or Fox News, I'll add, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect thelema, will of God. Let's continue. For by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now he gives the illustration of being a body and talks about the spiritual gifts, this empowerment by the Holy Spirit that you get this stuff done with. That's how you do it. He continues, love must be without hypocrisy, detest evil, cling to what is good, show family affection to one another with brotherly love, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lack diligence, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, be persistent in prayer, share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless those who persecute you. You think you're being persecuted yet? I don't think so. You may think so, but I don't think so. Bless and do not curse. They're being persecuted, by the way. And this is what Paul says. This is what God says. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be in agreement with one another. Do not be proud. Instead, associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Who? Someone? Anyone. Nobody. Try to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. If possible, on your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his wrath. For it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I, God, will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. He's quoting the Proverbs. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Here, here is what people have said to me, and so I'm going to correct it. Well, Gene, that's just the church. That's just the people in the church. Really, keep reading then, chapter 13. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. It's not about the church. Yes, edifying one another with the spiritual gifts. Yes, 
But did you hear that? That's God saying it, not me. I didn't make this up. This is the word of God, not my opinion. Not my opinion. Everyone, who? Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, not to me, to the government. For there is no authority except from God. For some reason, God causes all of this. Did it to the Israelites? I guess so. Huh. And those that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command. Did you hear that? The one who is resisting the authority is opposing God's command. If you don't know this or you haven't heard this, I left a bunch of Bibles on the counter out there. Take one with you and check my work. It's right here. We didn't have time to do the slides. And those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. I don't see a but here. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For government is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For government is God's servant and avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. And for this reason, you pay taxes. It talks about taxes. Did you know that? Pay your taxes. Since the authority are God's public servants, God's public servants. He doesn't delineate. We'll get into it in a minute. It's worse than you think. God's public servants continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone. Taxes, those you owe taxes. Tolls, to those you owe tolls. He's going through a gamut of different things here. Respect those you owe respect to, honor those you owe honor to. I want you to go home and read the rest of this. Because when he gets to chapter 14, he says, honor those who disagree with you. It's not gospel. Honor them. Or don't cause them to stumble either if they're struggling with it. Oh, like don't get on the internet and in the comments section mock everyone who doesn't agree with you? You mean like that? Something like that. Yeah, but actually they did it face-to-face -face back then. They weren't keyboard warriors. Read Romans. We can keep going. He writes a letter to Titus. A couple of his protégés show up in the Bible. Timothy and Titus. So we'll take a look. I'm not going to get to as much as I want to today, but as you guys want to stay here. We have food. That should be all right. <laughs> I might have to overview some of this. So, Titus, one of my favorite letters of the Bible. Titus is a guy, kind of like an overseer, an elder. So it would be like our overseer, Pastor Wayne, sending me to Crete, right, in Greece. I would love that. Anyway, he does that, but it's probably not as fun for Titus. And he's supposed to go there and appoint elders in every town. So he's going to set up a bunch of churches there. And so it's just really an instruction manual for Titus. It's really like a short version of 1 Timothy, just three chapters, and it moves pretty quick. So he does his normal kind of opening greetings that he does with people he's writing to. And he thanks God for him. And it gets kind of interesting because he just talks about what Titus should tell certain people groups, right? So he goes, Older men, older women, the younger women. And in the midst of all this, slaves as well. Obey your masters, you're serving God. And in the midst of this, he says something that always gets me. So he goes through, and chapter 2, but you must say the things that are consistent with sound teaching. So he's got to be a good teacher, Titus. Older men are, be, are to be level-headed, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in their behavior, not slanders, not addicted to much wine, all the obvious stuff. They are to teach what is good so they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, homemakers, kind, and submissive to their husbands. Read 1 Peter, though, it goes the other way around, too. So that God's message, this is very interesting, so that God's message will not be slandered. You're to behave well, all the Christian groups, he's telling all of them, in the same way. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled. So on and on and on, slaves, everybody. 
Why? So you don't slander God's message. Do you know what the word is there in Greek? Some of you have been in church for a while. What's the unforgivable sin? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, right? That's what it says. What it says in Greek is, so they do not blaspheme the gospel. Serious. This is very serious language. So that by their behavior, if they behave badly, they might blaspheme God's gospel. Did you know you could do that? With your behavior, you don't have to do it with your mouth. Or maybe you do. You can do it with your behavior. Unbelievable. So he caps off this section. Just listen to this. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age while we wait. While we wait while we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, a definitive statement of Jesus' deity. He gave himself for us so we could do whatever we want? No, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. And check this out. Remind them, chapter 3, skipped over 15, but 2, 3, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. There it is again. Imagine that. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one except Democrats, right? We can slander them. That's what it says. Correct? No. No. No, to slander no one, to avoid fighting, wow, and to be kind always. When? Oh, on Sundays, just on Sundays. Always be kind on Sundays, that's it. All right, so this is my opinion here. We're going to put that in there, right? Be kind to all people on Sundays, always showing gentleness to all people, just in case you don't get the joke. I'm kidding. Always. For we too were once foolish, We were once disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions, pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds that we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out abundantly upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified, by his grace, we may have the hope of eternal life. That's what it's all about. <laughs> I've been asked the question, <laughs> what if they take our Bibles away? You mean the one you don't read? You don't sound too concerned. Doesn't sound genuine to me. Well, I'll propose a solution. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Memorize it. Do you know it says that in there? Mm. Read Deuteronomy 6, the beginning of Joshua. It says it in there. Famous prayer, the Shema. Deuteronomy 6.4. If you run into a young Jewish person... They recite it every day. They memorize it. They memorize the word of God. It said that by 13, we'd have the Torah, the first five books memorized back in the day. The Pharisees had to memorize the whole thing. You can do it. It's possible. It says to walk along with your children in Deuteronomy. And as you're walking along, teach them these words. Meditate on them continually, all the time. Ooh, digest it constantly. Make it a part of you. First Timothy 4, it's what Paul tells Timothy. Be constantly nourished on the scriptures. This is where our nourishment comes from. From here, not there. It ruins your mind. It's poisoning you. This is our nourishment, and the Bible says it. 
New and Old Testament. I'm going to keep going. Who's going to say stop? <laughs> that was so manipulative. I apologize. <laughs> like, really, I mean, honestly, someone's going to be like, yeah, I'm hungry, Pastor. Smell the potluck upstairs. All right. You can. You could get away with it. If you're new, we joke. That's what we do here. I get serious for a couple minutes, but then I can't do it anymore. <laughs> People ask the question, what are we going to do if it gets worse? What are we going to do if it gets worse? We're going to do what God tells us to do. And you know what that is? Some of you are not going to like it. First and second Peter, he's writing to Christians who are being persecuted. That's really the bottom line there. Trying to give them encouragement. It happens a lot. They've got to do that because there's persecution, even among their own people. At first, Jewish believers. Acts 17, Thessalonica. Right? They don't like them there. Chase them out of town. They don't like this new sect. What is this? Get out of here. Even the Sadducees and the Pharisees are arguing with one another all the time. But they persevere. They continue in what they're doing. So Thessalonians, first and second, written to a persecuted church, probably by their own people, the Jewish people. It's a very early letter. So these letters, these books of the Bible are not in order. So it's probably one of Paul's earliest. He writes them. Peter, on the other hand, probably happening a little bit later. Second Peter, he's pretty convinced that he's, he's going to die. A persecuted church, and now the Romans are joining in. A guy named Nero might have heard of him. He starts persecuting them. So you can kind of expand this into First Peter. I don't know, but this is the point. This is the backdrop I'm trying to give you. Do you think you have problems? Nero enjoyed lighting Christians on fire and watching them run around until they died. Men, women, children, nobody was excluded. Nobody. It was horrible. 1 Peter 4.12. Don't be surprised that literally, you guys might know, the fiery trials that you're experiencing. It's literally the burning that you're experiencing. Burning them alive until they're dead. It's horrible. Is it that bad for us? <laughs> I don't think so. We have laws protecting us. Amazing. They didn't have that back then. It's quite different. And then here's what it says. 1 Peter 2, 11. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and temporary residents to abstain from fleshly desires that wage war against you. Temporary residents of where? Rome? The world. We're all going to die. Aliens, temporary residents. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles. Pagans, better translation. So that in case of so non-Christians, honorably among the outsiders. So that in a case where they speak against you as those who do what is evil, they will, by observing your good works, glorify God on the day of visitation. When Jesus comes back, you see where he's going? Look at this, right there, 13. Submit to every human authority. Again, can you imagine that? This keeps coming up, doesn't it? It must be important. Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the emperor, that would be Nero, literally it says the king, but that's who he means, as the supreme authority, or to governors, as those sent out by him to punish those who do what is evil and praise those who do what is good. For it is God's will that you silence the ignorance of foolish people by doing good. How do we silence them? By posting in the comment section? No, by doing good. And what does it say again? Let's just, got to get this right. Submit to every human authority. We'll, we'll do a little more. Timothy. First Timothy. Let me get in here. I'll show you what we're supposed to do while we wait for the appearing of our great God and Savior, 
Jesus Christ. He tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, first of all then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved. Someone? Everyone. You see how Paul conducted himself in Acts It's remarkable. Acts 24, 26 as well. Situation here is that Paul, again, persecuted by his own people. They don't like him. They get him in trouble. They make a big riot at the temple. And so he's taken off by the Roman guard. And they just don't know what to do with him. They don't understand it. They're like, well, he hasn't done anything worthy of death, but whatever, the people don't like him. So they put him in prison first governor has taken care of him is named Felix. The Bible tells us he's corrupt. He keeps Paul in prison for two years because he's waiting on a bribe. He wants Paul to give him some money to get him out. That's what's going on for two years. And it tells us that Paul just preaches the gospel to him. Paul never says, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. By the way, he's a Roman citizen, too. He has rights. He has rights. He could have said, this is not fair. Two years. Finally, Felix, and history tells us, he gets kicked out of that position because he's corrupt. Festus comes in. Festus doesn't know what to do with him. Why is this guy in here? It's kind of interesting. Now, he's friends with a couple other people. King Agrippa and Bernice, or Berenice. You don't get this from the Bible, but if you study your history, they weren't people of controversy. They're people who'd be on the news a lot. Why? Well, they were a couple, but they were brother and sister. So it would have been on the news. A lot of people were talking about it. So Festus approaches them because they're Jewish, kind of, sort of, and so they know what Paul might be talking about. So he has a meeting. He says, hey, you want to listen to Paul? Listen to this guy. So he gets kind of like his chance of a hearing, I would say, before them. And now we're in Acts 26. And he doesn't get up there and say, you guys are wrong. (laughs) No. Most honorable Festus and Agrippa, motions with his hands. Honorable. He honors them. Finally, he's just going at it. And he says, In this short time, do you want me to become a Christian, Paul? (laughs) He says, yeah, except for these chains. It was an opportunity to preach the gospel, not to rebuke an outsider. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So, The real question we should be asking ourselves is not, what are we going to (laughs) do? No. I hope hope you know what we should do now. I could keep reading. We're going to run out of time. I want to be honorable to you in your schedule. We know what we should do. Pray, wait, love. That's it. Tell people about Jesus, because that usually opens the door a whole lot better than arguing with people, doesn't it? More flies with honey, is that what they say? It's like that. The real question we should be asking ourselves is what is Jesus going to do? It tells us. I'll give you a little window into it. I was going to read it all to you today, but I'll run out of time. We get to Revelation. And in Greek, it's the Apocalypse of John. That's what it's called. The Apocalypse of John in Greek, not Revelation. Kind of interesting. So you have these different scenes, and it gets confusing. Later, maybe we'll, yeah, the rest of the story, we'll get into it. So there's like letters to seven churches. Part of it's a letter. And it kind of goes in and out of time, which is why people have a really hard time understanding it. But as you get toward the end, the word of God comes. The judgment sword out of his mouth. Jesus comes back. It's a prophecy. This is true. He's coming back. He does the work. 
He finished the work the first time on the cross, and he's going to come back and do the judgment. That's not for you to do. He comes back to judge the world. Some interesting things happen before that in chapter 6 and 7. We see that the fifth seal is now broken. And so you have these people who are called martyrs, but specifically, if you know the language a little better, they're the ones who got beheaded for the message, for being Christians. And it's like this scene where they kind of wake up and they say, when are we going to get our vengeance? And they're given white robes. They're told to wait. Nobody here has had their head cut off. Hold on. It's coming. And then we get another scene with those who died in the tribulation. They're worshiping God. Oh, Christians are going to go through a tribulation? Yes. There's actually nothing in there that says we won't. It says we do. Read chapter 7 again. Those who died, they were martyred in the tribulation. Then we continue and we see the first resurrection. Did you know there are two? There's a first one. Don't you want to be resurrected first? Sounds nice. Get our new heavenly bodies and we get into that new heavens and the new earth where there are no more tears. There's no more oppression. We don't even need the sun, the moon, the stars because the sun will be our light. Doesn't that sound nice? Don't you want to be a part of the first resurrection? Because the second one happens a thousand years later. Do you really want to wait? Well, guess who gets to be a part of the first resurrection? The ones who got beheaded. That's how you get in first. Read it. Revelation 20. You want to get in first? Get your head cut off. That's what it says. Blessed are those who experience the first resurrection, it says. Blessed are you who are persecuted. Sound a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? Blessed are you, those who mourn. That's how you get to be a part of the first resurrection. What did they do? What are we going to do? Get beheaded. Sounds fantastic in the end. <laughs> See you in a thousand years, Dan. You're just, you're hangry. That's your problem. We got food upstairs, man. Calm down. We have to look at the world through a biblical lens. I'm just trying to give you the word of God. And just please check my work. I'm begging you. Just turn off the TV. All right? If you want the chapters, email me. Look at the website, c3naples.org. Let me know. I'll send them to you. I'll be so glad that you're digging into the Word of God to hear that you guys are being nourished by God's Word. It will cleanse you. You will begin thinking differently about the world. Believe me. It's brought me so much healing. I know so many of you are suffering right now. You've been infected. You actually believe this stuff. You actually believe this. This is the only thing you should believe. Unless I'm speaking it, don't believe me. Don't. I'm nobody. This is the only thing you should believe. And it will heal you. It's healed me. So, maybe you got the TV. Maybe you got distracted by it after you put it up on the wall. Maybe you forgot to give back what belongs to God or the government. The real question we have to ask ourselves, what programs are we going to watch? What program are we going to tune into? Are we going to tune into the world? Or are we going to tune into the word? I'm praying for you guys. And if you need prayer, I want to encourage you. Fill out that connection card. We pray over those things. 
Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, for these people, their devotion to come here in the first place. I thank you for that, that they would listen, that they would honor me. And Lord, just strengthen me so I can continue to listen to you and honor them, to guide them in love and righteousness as we wait in joyful anticipation of the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.